Hello, everyone. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ in recovery for codependency. My name is Beatrice. Tonight's topic is the fourth step, which says we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. To inventory something is to take a complete count of items or goods. At home, my main area of work is our kitchen because I am in charge of making sure that the five people that live at home get fed. And so one of the things that I have to continually do is keep inventory of what's in our fridge. I have to make sure, well, my husband's here, so I have to be honest. I try to make sure that we have a few healthy things in there. I try to make sure that we've got snacks and ingredients for dinner, um, that anything that's gone moldy or rancid uh, gets thrown away as soon as possible. Um, and during that process, as I'm doing that, I find that I have to take a lot of stuff out of the fridge, old Tupperware containers. I find things that I didn't even knew that were there. Um, I find things that are no longer gonna be useful. Um, I find things that are smelly. I find snacks that I tell my kids, you better eat this today, because tomorrow it's gonna be bad. We gotta save money, so I feed them all whatever I can last minute. But, and that process is, it's, it's a worry process. It takes the time. I really have to be intentional about what I'm doing. But at the end, I have a functional fridge. I know what's in it. I know what I need or what we lack, and it really is helpful and useful to our family. And so as I was thinking of this lesson, and I was cleaning my fridge, um, I thought, you know, it's very much like the fourth step that we have to do when we come into recovery. Because from the day that we were born, we had to learn how to deal and cope with life on life's terms. But unfortunately for many of us as children, we were often limited on our coping skills. We were limited because we were young, we were innocent, a lot of us had lack of understanding. Many of us grew up with alcohol or drugs in our home, and so that really brought a lot of dysfunction. A lot of things were never talked about or explained to us. So growing up, what we did with those things, the feelings, the questions, the problems is we just stuffed them and started piling them up one on top of another without ever really stopping to take stock or to figure out if those things that we snuck in there or that we stuck in there are even useful to us anymore. As we enter the rooms of recovery, many of us come in here with defeat over some kind of addiction or compulsion or behavior, and the more we show up, the more we come to realize that many of the things that we have brought in with us really are no longer useful, that they've actually become destructive, that we carry expired, moldy, rancid things, and there are parts of us that are no longer functional, that in fact, most of those ways are actually now childish and foolish. The Bible speaks of these things in 1 Corinthians 13, 11. It says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. I struggled with that scripture when I came into recovery because quite honestly, I didn't know any other way other than the ways I knew. I didn't even know what defined if it was childish or if it was adult behavior that I was engaging with. It was, it was so, so part of me. So how exactly can we give up those childish ways unless we take the courageous step to know what those ways are? Learning and taking an inventory is what it's all about. A moral inventory will consist of looking back at our whole lives and just like when I took the time to clean up my fridge and I knew exactly what was in there, we too, when we embark on the inventory, will no longer sit back not knowing the truth of who we are and what we carry in us. It is no wonder that the step says that we must be searching because some of these things we have tucked in real deep for a long time. 
It is no wonder that we must be fearless, for we will probably uncover much that's not very pleasant to us. The big book of AA says this of the fourth step. Next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us had never attempted. Though our decision, and this is speaking of the third step, which is surrendering our will to our God of our understanding, which here we choose to call Jesus Christ, was a vital and crucial step. It could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and to be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. Our liquor, or drugs, or sex, or control, or food, or anxiety, or depression, or whatever may have brought you here, was nothing but a symptom. So we had to get down to the causes and conditions. As the big book of AA says, these things have been blocking us, not only from gaining sobriety and sanity in our lives, but also from the blessings that God has for us. Jeremiah 5.25 says, you wrongdoings have kept these away. Speaking of God's blessings, your sins have deprived you of good. I hope that you can see how essential it is to take the time to do the step. Tonight, I get to do the practical work of walking through how do I actually do this. We use a method here that Celebrate Recovery is put together, but please know that there are many ways to do it. And as long as the method that you use will help you to stay honest and be thorough, it's a good way. Use it. If you have a sponsor that's walked you through a different way, please don't feel like you have to shift everything. Just make sure that you're continually doing it and that you are being honest and thorough. If you are new to recovery, I want to extend our welcome to you again. I would like to ask you to keep an open mind as you see this process. Remember, this is the fourth step. There's a few steps before you get here. If you have not reached this step, I'm excited and hopeful that you might learn how to use this great tool for the when the time comes. Okay, so this is the sheet that we're gonna go through today. It's called the Inventory Worksheet. It's set up in five columns. Each column is gonna serve a purpose. The first one is, says the person. Column two is the cause or the event. Column three is the effect. Column four is the damage. And column five is my part. I'm gonna take you guys through each column and then I'm gonna do a little example because I think it helps um, to get a better idea of what the process should look like. In the first column, it says the person column. In this column, you're gonna list the names of the persons who have caused some kind of hurt, resentment, or fear in you. Go as far back as you can. Your inventory will be many pages. Just ask the people that have gone through this before. Many pages. Uh, some examples of what you will write here are the names of family members, friends, bosses, other people, even institutions like churches, um, the government, police, places, and surprisingly to some of us, even God will go on this column. For my example, I'm going to use my dad, kind of an easy one. Most of us should have, no, all of us should have our parents on our inventory. We've lived with them long enough, and even if we didn't. There's another reason to put them in your inventory. Um, the second column is the cause and event. In that column, you're going to list the specific action that someone did that hurt, angered, or somehow caused you to resent them. And here you're going to have things like, he or she left me, yelled at me, showed up drunk, they embarrassed me, they belittled me, they hurt my brother or sister, they abused me, and so on. No doubt that looking back at some of these events can be very painful. But remember, 
what God promises in Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. And if you ask those that have come before you and have entered this step and have made it to the other side, they will tell you it was the work of God. He really does strengthen us through the process. For my example, column two, I'll ask myself, so what action did my dad do that hurt me? Well, my first inventory, I had many actions he did, so I'm only going to go through one of them. But in order to tell you that, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in Mexico to a family of five. My mom died when I was three, and very shortly after, my dad, now being a single dad of five kids and a recently sobered up alcoholic, um, made a great sacrifice. And he left our country of birth, and he came here to California to work and be able to provide for us. I was very little, and his decision, even though it really was never meant to hurt me, in fact, it blessed me, because as a result of him coming here, I was fed, I had shelter, and I was able to stay with my family without being divided. Uh, nonetheless, it hurt me. So, for me, in the cause, I'm going to write, he left us very young in my country of birth to come here to the U.S. and work. One of the reasons that I like to give this example is because I think it's really important as you work through your inventory to make sure that you don't skip or dismiss things in your life that others did and that they did without meaning to hurt you. Because here's the thing. I have learned that the things that hurt you are not, may not hurt me. I forgot. I have this fancy thing. And the hurt, things that might hurt me may not even hurt you, right? And so this is an inventory that's personal to you. This isn't the time to question, should I really have gotten hurt by that? Should that really be a painful thing? It doesn't matter, because guess what? It already is, right? So just write it down. The third column is the effect column. In this one, you're going to start doing the hard work of looking inward and asking yourself, how did that affect me? One of the questions I like to ask as I go through this is, what emotions, what feelings developed as a result of that event? In this column, you might have things like, I felt lonely, sad, angry, ashamed. This is a great time to bring out, they have these um, sheets of the feeling sheets, we call them, when it has like 50 types of feelings. Um, especially if you're not familiar with feelings, which when I came to recovery, I wasn't. I knew happy or angry, believe it or not. I never cried. You wouldn't know that by knowing me today because I cry all the time. Ask my husband. He doesn't know what to do with so much emotion. Uh, but I have many years to make up for. That's what I tell him. Um, so the feeling sheets is really helpful when you get to this. Um, so, and the other thing is, remember, before you start your inventory, before you're going to sit down and work on this, pray and ask God to help you see what you need to see today. The cool thing about recovery is that really it is a lifelong journey. And so if you don't see something today, that's OK. You'll see it the next time. So, um, so I want to encourage you to pray. And then also, as you're going through this process, journal. I know, some of that's really hard for some of you guys. But journaling is really important to help you sort out some of these things that have been bottled up for many years that many of us don't even know how to put into words. Feel free to write pages upon pages about a hurt or an event in your life. I find that writing it down also makes it very real. When I came in, some of the things that I had piled down deep, I couldn't tell if it was a dream or real 
until I wrote it out, and then I realized, you know what, that really did happen. So as I was working through this, I'm going to share with you my journal entry, because I really needed to kind of let things out before I even knew what I felt. So here's an example of my journal entry during that time. I wrote, I can't believe that he left, speaking of my dad, when I was that young. What kind of parent leaves his little four-year-old girl only a year after her mother died? Does he not realize how much I needed him? Does, did he not care? If he had not left me, maybe I wouldn't have been sexually abused. Maybe I wouldn't have always felt so abandoned, walking around like a little orphan. I remember when all the other little girls had their parents with them, but not me. I was always alone and poor and dirty, and no one wanted me. No one. That's why I started falling for the jerks who treated me horribly. That's why I ended up having sex with the guys I did. I hated myself, and now my life is a mess. Now, looking back, I can tell you I feel very different about some of those things, but that's how I felt in the moment, and I needed to acknowledge that that's what, that's what had happened in me, and that's what I was going through before I can even get to the next step. So once I did some journaling, I was better able to identify how the event affected me. From my journaling, I filled out my third column, and I learned that I felt like an orphan. I felt lonely. I felt fearful. I felt unprotected, and boy, did I feel angry. These first three columns are intended to be simply tools to help you identify the last two columns which is really where you want to get. See, the next two columns are really the key to uncovering your true character. Many of us come and live our lives, it is said, with three characters. The character that you think you have, the character that other people think you have, and the character that you truly have. And going through this step really helps you get to the true um, nature of your character. Many of us came in here wearing masks and hiding from the truth. But as Pastor Scott often says, it is this truth that will set us free. As you move forward in the worksheet, it is so crucial not to stay stuck in those first three columns. As you move forward, no longer associating the rest of the work in this with the person and what they may have done to you. Honestly, I can't emphasize that enough. See, the scripture that goes with this step is Lamentations 340, right? And the scripture says, let us examine our ways and test them. Let us return to the Lord. Notice that it doesn't say, let us examine their ways, right? So I'm not going to spend this time trying to figure out what my dad did or criticize him or weigh the blame on him. I'm only using that to get me to examine what's now inside of me, because that is what brought me to recovery. I urge you to consider that for many of us, it was the dwelling on those first three columns and living over the pain and the guilt and the shame of what took place and of the people that hurt us that kept us going back to our addiction and our, com our compulsive behaviors. So, as you think of the damage, you're no longer going to think about that person and about what they did. Instead, you're going to focus on that column where we wrote the effects. And you're going to see what have you discovered so far and ask yourself, as a result of the emotions or feelings, what damaging things developed inside of me? Some of the things in this column might be, I became mistrustful of people. I thought no one cares for me. I believed I was ugly, unlovable. I believed that my feelings were not important. I, started grow or I grew up believing that I'm not worth anything. For my example, I'm no longer going to think about my dad and about what he did or didn't do. At this point, I'm going to start looking at how I was affected. So for me, as a result of feeling like an orphan, I started believing that I'm not worthy of having a dad around, like all the other kids are. 
I started thinking that I must not be lovable. Started believing that I must have done something wrong. And then I'm just going to keep working down that column to the next item in my list. And again, I'll ask myself, all right, so through this process, I discovered that I feel lonely. As a result of feeling lonely, what are some of the damages or beliefs that I have today? Well, one of the beliefs that I have is that I don't matter to others. And I keep going down the list. As a result of being fearful, I started believing that I can't make a mistake or that things could only get worse. As a result of feeling unprotected, I started thinking, I must be strong to survive. As a result of feeling angry about my situation, I've lived believing that life is not fair and I am the victim in it. Beware of not rushing through this process. Doing an inventory is not just a checkoff box that says, okay, I've done that little worksheet. Doing an inventory allows light to come into those hard, dark places that we have been hiding and running from. For many of us, as you do this, it will be the first time in your whole life that we will sit in moments of pain, frustration, loneliness, suffering, and choose not to run. And that is hard work. Yet, I can tell you, coming from someone who absolutely despises pain, it's doable. Not only is it doable, but it's absolutely necessary if we're gonna keep moving forward in these steps. Our old ways haven't worked. We must now move one foot in front of the other and trust those who have come before us and found the miracle that we so desperately seek. And when things get hard, remember that the one who is doing the ultimate work in us is God. No matter how you have been hurt, no matter how lost you may feel, God wants to comfort and restore you. Ezekiel 34, 16 says, I will look for those who are lost. I will bring back those who wander off, bandage those that are hurt, and heal those that are sick. And is this not a room full of those? You are in great company here. The last column of your inventory is the column labeled my part. In this column, we will ask ourselves, remember, we're not gonna talk, I'm not gonna think about my dad, what he did or didn't do. I'm only gonna go back to the previous column because now I'm looking at the damage that's inside of me and I'm gonna ask myself, all right, as a result of the damage that I carry in my life, who have I hurt, right? Because this is my inventory, it's not my dad's. Who have I hurt? What have I done as a result of this? What choices, what behaviors, what attitudes and sins have resulted? In this column, you might have things like, I lied to my spouse, cheated, stole, disrespected, abused, Overate, used alcohol to numb, left my children to party, mistreated my body, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you're truly doing a thorough and honest inventory, this column should be the longest list of all the columns. Psalm, 31, Psalm 139, 23 tells us, examine me, O God, and know my mind Test me and discover if there's any evil in me and guide me in the everlasting way. If you've been in an abusive relationship or if you were abused, especially as a small child, you can find great freedom in this part of the inventory. You can see by writing things down that you had no part and no responsibility for the cause of the resentment. This is a great time to write the words not guilty in column five. You can begin 
to be free from the misplaced shame and guilt that you've carried with you. But once you've done that, you can continue to work down the list and fill in your part for the, re for the related, and fill in your part related to the damage that you've discovered. For me, column five, my part, I ask myself, all right, as a result of me believing that I'm not worthy of having a dad around like other kids are, what are some things that I did? Well, I looked to fill that void with men. I became obsessed with keeping a boyfriend around, whether they were a good guy or not. And because this is a thorough and honest inventory, we need to get specific on how we did these things. So in my inventory, I wrote, I lied to Caesar. I controlled and seduced Joe and Caesar. I snuck boyfriends in my home. I lied and disrespected my dad's home. I wore makeup and wiped it off when I went home as I was growing up. I flirted with men, married or single. I compromised my sexuality to keep a guy around. My next item on my list is I must not be lovable. As a result of me not believing that I'm lovable, some of the things I have done are negative self-talk. I continually would put myself down, call myself names like stupid, dumb, ugly, dirty. I tell myself nobody loves me, and they never will. I sought out my value and approval from people and accomplishments. I competed with coworkers, and then I wrote names here, Sonia, so that I could come up on top and feel better about myself. I put on masks so that others would approve of me. I was fake with my boss, Eddie. Notice that if you do this honestly and thoroughly, you will have a pattern of an event that was done to you that really should bring you to see many of the things in that last column. Because we have a saying in recovery, and it's hurt people, hurt people, right? Who do you do an inventory sheet on? Everyone in your life, present or past. That's why there's a lot of pages. The more thorough that you are, the greater result you will see. Some people find it helpful to go in chronological order from when they were itty bitty and all the way up to now. Some people find it helpful to start with the people that are close to them right now like their immediate family, and then kind of move out, further out to more acquaintances or old friends. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how you do it, as long as you cover everyone that you can think of that you've done life with and have some kind of a hurt or resentment with. Do it to the best of your ability. If you can't remember stuff, it's okay. You'll probably get a chance to work at it again in the future. Keep the process balanced. Take breaks when you're working on this. Build friendships in group. Reward yourself in the process. Celebrate your work. This takes a lot of work and a lot of courage to embark into this. Use Bible verses to replace damaging beliefs with the truth of God's word about you Make sure that whatever coping thing you choose, that it is healthy and not a new and healthy addiction. So sitting down to work on your inventory with a big bowl of ice cream and apple pie is probably not the best idea. <laughs> so lastly, but most of, of most importance, remember that bringing these things out in the light is ultimately for your benefit. It's for our benefit. God knows all of it. He was there when everything happened. Nothing that you write down is a surprise to him. But only through bringing it out can we receive the gift of forgiveness and healing. 
Remember what God says in Isaiah 118. Come, let's talk this over, says the Lord. No matter how deep the stains of your sins, I can take it out and make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. Even if you're stained as red as crimson, I can make you white as wool. Amen? Amen. He can. Thank you. Thank you for letting me share. All right, let's give B one more round of applause for an excellent teaching. That was an awesome teaching, B. And if you guys are not in a step study now or haven't done the fourth step, please join one. We got two of them that just started, one on Mondays, one on Thursdays, so that you can apply what you just learned tonight in your next four step. Four step will bring great healing. So thank you very much, B. Now, can we all stand and we will say the serenity prayer. God, grant me serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the simple world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever and the next. Amen.